Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kendra Baumer. I'm the Senior Engagement Manager uh, with the TRAIL Conference, and I want to give a huge thank you um, to our presenter today, Elaine Silverstein, and I am going to pass it off to her uh, to do an introduction and take it from here. Okay. Are you all seeing lots of pictures of pretty native plants there? I just yeah. shared my screen. Okay. Go ahead and click um, present the presenter mode in PowerPoint though so we get the full screen. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to the trail conference for asking me to do this. Um, I am a, a, a longtime trail conference volunteer in various programs. I'm also the co-chair, co-leader of the Bergen Passaic chapter of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. Um, I hope a lot of you will both join the trail conference and join um, the Native Plant Society after hearing this presentation. And I'm a horticulturist trained at the New York Botanical Garden with certification in sustainable la um, landscape management. So um, I design and install gardens based on native plants only. So we're gonna talk today really about two major things. I'm gonna talk a little bit at the beginning about the garden that has been planted around the trail conference and the volunteer program that's involved in that. But then most of the presentation is going to be about how you can duplicate a garden like that in your own setting. Um, so let us begin. So, oh, sorry, ground rules. Um, please keep your microphones turned off. Um, I will stop a couple of time for questions and please use the raise your hand option at the bottom of your screen and the moderator will call on you. Um, if you have questions at other times, you can type them in the chat bar and then I'll go through, I'll, hopefully we'll have enough time at the end and I'll go through um, all of the questions. Um, if you type your full name in the chat box, we will send you a copy of the resource list. I'm going to be referring back to that a couple of times. Um, so if you want that, be sure to put your full name in the chat box. And then the trail conference volunteers will send you um, the resource list that I've prepared for this talk. So let's go on. I think I'm not actually in full screen. Hang on. Well, anyway, I think it's okay. I think you can, um, you can see the slides very well. The, um, the garden around the trail conference headquarters, and I would imagine a lot of you are familiar with it in Mawa around this beautiful building, was designed and installed in 2015. And Habitat Helpers is a volunteer program that maintains the garden. Um, I and my two co-leaders of our chapter of the Native Plant Society kind of lead this effort. And we just found out yesterday, in fact, that we are going to begin to allow people to work in the garden. We have not been able to do that for the past two months where normally we would have started. But you, um, if you're involved in, with the trail conference as a volunteer, you should get information about this very soon. Um, if you have never been involved in this and you would like to be, I would suggest you just Google trail, New York, New Jersey trail conference and then find the habitat helpers in there. Um, but you should get that information soon. So this is um, um, a garden that was, you can see what it looked like um, in 2015. There was almost nothing there. And last year in 2019, it's, um, I think, a very beautiful um, garden based on native plants. It was designed to fit in with the landscape. It's a habitat. The, um, the, it includes all native species that are well adapted to the site, which is a natural wetland. The designer um, chose a variety of small trees, shrubs, grasses, and perennials. And the wild plants and the other natural features in the area were included wherever possible. Um, it in, it, um, there are a lot of invasive plants in the area as well that require vigilance. We, um, almost all the plants are perennials, and this is true of a lot of our native plants. They are perennials, you plant them once, they come up forever, but that means you have to, they will regrow each year, but you also have to remove last year's dead growth. So this is what the garden looks like in the spring when it's ready for a new season. And somebody was able to do that this year. Hey, Elaine. Yes. 
Um, we have folks requesting to put it into full slide mode. So if you just Not. click this button on the on the very bottom of PowerPoint, yes. directly next to the slider. Um, one more over. Yep, click that. I'm sorry about that. There you go. There we go. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, hope that's better. So, um, so the, um, the, actually the major maintenance that needs to be done for a native plant garden is to remove the dead material in spring. And as you can see, that was done here. And we have um, volunteer sessions throughout the year, throughout the season, where um, people do help with the spring cleanup. We plant, we weed, prune, we trim the plants, and we, we remove invasives. Um, though tends to be, they tend to be nice work sessions. For the most part, they're done on Sunday mornings. We do have some afternoon sessions as well. And um, you learn gardening if you're not, if you're um, not proficient at it yet. Um, it's a place that where uh, master gardeners can volunteer and it, they can get volunteer hours for it. And uh, sometimes you get plants and seeds. So <laughs> these are just a few of the really lovely plants that were installed in this garden. Um, birch tree, this is a cool plant. It gets to be about six to eight feet tall and it's a great big um, Rudbeckia. It's um, Rudbeckia gigantica, I believe. Um, this is a verbena. This is a Heliopsis, or false sunflower. Um, this is a Monarda, of course. And this is Panic grass, um, uh, Panicum virginicum, which is the major grass that was installed um, in the garden as, as part of this habitat. And this is something that came up on its own. It's um, dogbane, which is in the milkweed family. Um, but it came up on its own, and it's spreading very nicely there. So are there any questions about, before I move on, about Habitat Helpers, about how you can get involved, about what the program does, anything like that at this point? No? Okay, I'm gonna go on. So, um, the most basic topic that I wanna cover today is why plant native plants? And I would imagine to some extent I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, there, um, so I wanna go through this very quickly, but um, there are a lot of reasons for planting native plants. They are beautiful and they are easy to grow. They can sometimes be hard to find. Um, I find that that's the main thing that my clients need is, helping, is help in finding the plants. Um, there is a native plant for any site, no matter how difficult. If you have a spot that's always wet, there are, with standing water, there are native plants for that. If you have bone dry, sandy soil, as I did when I started out, there are native plants for that. There are beautiful plants um, for shade, for sun, for any situation, for growing in clefts of rocks. Um, so there are, um, you can always find a native plant that will be right for you. Um, the major reason, though, for planting native plants is to make them part of the habitat, is to create a habitat. Only native plants can feed insects throughout their life cycles. I think probably that most people know that monarch butterfly caterpillars can only eat milkweed. It's the only thing they can eat are plants in the milkweed family, and the Asclepius genus in particular. So. Right here, this is in my garden, this is orange butterfly weed. You can see there's two monarch caterpillars um, munching away very happily right there. Um, but what many people don't know is that every butterfly and every moth and some other insects are exactly that specific. They can only eat the plants. Sometimes it's one species, sometimes one genus, sometimes one family, but they're very, very specific in what they can eat. So if you plant, um, Asian uh, butterfly bush, Budlia, which is it's a good example because it, the name is terrible. People plant um, Budlia thinking that it's going to attract butterflies, and it will attract some adult butterflies, but there's not a single North American butterfly whose caterpillar can eat that bush. So there's no food for the butterflies throughout their life cycle if you plant non-native plants, and that's true of 
most of the plants in garden centers because most of them are from Asia, a few are from, a few are from Europe, and they will they will not feed our native butterflies and and um, and and moths, which means you will not have caterpillars in your garden. If you don't have caterpillars in your garden, you will also not have birds in your garden. Um, there have been um, many, many studies done recently about um, what birds need to reproduce successfully and what they need are native plants that are not sprayed with pesticides so that they can find um, caterpillars. It's particularly caterpillars. Um, the um, life basically depends on everybody eating everybody else. And um, if, you, um, if you don't have native plants, you won't have caterpillars. If you don't have caterpillars, you won't have birds period. Um, uh, so that is really the big reason for doing it. I just wanted to point out some cool things that happen in a garden. Um, these are these pictures were all taken in my garden. And um, some of you may know what these guys are. And they are ladybug larvae that are just about to turn into their adult stage. Um, ladybugs look different at different stages of life when they're, um, when they're really little, when they've just hatched. They look like little black and orange alligators, actually. Um, this is the next stage, and then you get the adult stage. They don't, they don't ever have a caterpillar stage. It's called incomplete metamorphosis. At the bottom of the screen here, can you see this little blue butterfly? That is an Eastern, um, I believe it's a spring azure butterfly. Um, every year, this will be happening in about another two weeks. It's a late spring. I will suddenly see these guys flying all around my garden and they're very tiny. They're only about an inch big. They fly very fast and they never, almost never seem to light. And except here, I actually caught this one. And what it's doing is this is a female laying its eggs on a flower cluster, the, the buds of um, New Jersey tea, Ceanathus americana. Um, this is a, a small native shrub with very beautiful flowers. It blooms in June. But these butterflies lay their eggs on the flower clusters of New Jersey tea and a couple of native dogwood species. That's it. Um, if you plant those species, you will most likely see these butterflies. But they're just all over the place and they're wonderful when they come out every year. I look forward to it. And then this is um, an adult buckeye butterfly, which I think is a really spectacular looking butterfly. It's feeding here on um, Agastache and these hyssop. And I had never seen one before and suddenly they started appearing in my garden last year. So um, ecologists say if you plant it, they will come and that is true. Um, what is a native plant? Very quickly. A native plant is a plant that was here before Europeans arrived on this continent. So it's a plant that was here, say, before 1492, although there were certainly some Europeans doing fishing expeditions and stuff before that. It's a plant, in other words, that evolved here within the native habitat. Um, it means it has defenses against all of our insects. Plants and insects have been in a battle. They've been engaged in a pitch battle for about 300 million years. Plants develop new defenses and insects think of ways around it. That's why only, only a few species can eat milkweed because it's full of cardiac glycosides, but those species have figured out ways to get around it or have evolved ways to get around it. So it's a plant that evolved here within the native habitat. It's also a plant that's a member of a pure species. Um, I strongly suggest is that you plant um, pure species rather than cultivars or hybrids. A cultivar, this, um, for example, this is um, arrowwood viburnum, which is a common name. Its, its correct Latin name is viburnum dentatum. It's dentatum because it has toothed, leaves with toothed margins. It's the only viburnum like that or the only native one. This is its flower, this is its fruit. So if you see a plant labeled Viburnum dentatum, that's a species. Um, the, um, the most reputable and the, the, the best um, native plant nurseries are always going to sell you pure species. Um, if you see a plant that's called something like Viburnum blue muffin, and there is a, there's a cultivar of this one called blue muffin with single quotes usually, single, single quotation marks around the name, that's a cultivar. That plant, either 
sprung up by itself or somebody developed it in some way and it's going to be different from the species in some way. The difference may just be that it's shorter and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not terrible. But if you change things like the flower shape, the flower color, the number of petals, if you make a double plant instead of a single plant, you're very likely not going to attract pollinators anymore. If you change leaf color, you're changing leaf chemistry and you may not be feeding feeding the pollinators, the, the caterpillars anymore. So I would strongly suggest that you avoid cultivars and hybrids. The way you know a plant is a hybrid is you'll see that X in its name. It means that they cross two different species to put it there. So cultivars and hybrids are in general plants that were developed by human beings. Pure species are plants that were developed by nature. Okay. A habitat, this is basic fourth grade stuff, so we'll go real quickly here. But a habitat is um, an area that includes food, water, and shelter for animals. Um, all creatures need the same thing, whether it's us or it's a monarch butterfly, we all need food, water, and shelter. Um, to create a native habitat, you need to plant native plants. If you plant them, again, if you plant them, the animals will come. Um, a native plant, a, a native habitat is made up of native plants that attract all of these creatures. Anyone with an outdoor space, no matter how small it is or how shady it is or how poor the soil is, can create the na a native habitat. You, if you have three square feet of space in a sunny spot, plant a milkweed, an aster, and a native grass. You've got a habitat. You're going to have you'll be amazed at the life that you'll have in your garden from those from those three plants. So the first step in creating a native habitat is to think about your site. Is your site sunny or shady? Is it wet or dry? What plants are already pr pr present? Do you have a lot of natives already? Do you have native trees that you can um, plant, that you can underplant? Do you have invasives that you have to get rid of? How big is the site? How many plants approximately do you need? So that's the, um, um, this right here, by the way, is um, I live in a rather small um, property, less than a quarter acre in a town that's in Bergen County that's completely built up. Um, this is my backyard and it's not a forest, it's my backyard. Those trees, everything there was planted from little tiny sticks and as you can see, there's a house right here and you can see it, but there it is. There's a habitat and you can do it in a very small area. So this was planted about 25 years ago and this picture was taken in 2008. The, the, the trees are bigger now, but, um, but that's uh, an example of what you can do to just get rid of lawn and to plant. Um, we planted um, bare root sticks and that's, and that's what they turned out to be. Um, here, this picture was taken at the native plant garden of the New York Botanical Garden in spring last year. And this is, um, this is um, a shady area. So it's, um, they planted under the trees um, that existed there. It's, a, it's just a beautiful setting. I would strongly suggest as soon as the garden opens, go see the native plant garden. It's beautiful all year round. Um, this is Amsonia. I think these are, um, these are sedges. And I believe that this is, it's hard to tell, my picture is not as clear as it should be, but I believe it is a native azalea that was just leafing out. Our native azaleas are deciduous and they tend to bloom before they leaf out. So this one, it seems like it was just finishing and leafing out. Um, but the, the, it's, just, it's just absolutely beautiful. This was all planted, it's a garden, but um, it's, it's just the color combinations they used and the way they designed it is just beautiful. Just go see it, it's gorgeous. Okay, so um, in a multi-layered habitat, you are creating layers when you're creating a garden. Um, nature exists in layers. There are birds that live in the tops of the trees, there are birds that live in the mid-level, there are birds that live on the ground. So there are creatures for every layer. So you wanna create layers to attract the widest variety of creatures. Um, this, uh, 
is a great schematic diagram. It shows it was done for um, in Australia, so you'll see that the, the spelling is a little bit off, but it's a great, um, it's just a great way to teach this idea. You want to have different layers. Birds are going to nest at different layers. They're going to find food at different layers. Um, you want to leave your leaf litter on the ground under the garden as mulch because lots and lots of creatures are going to overwinter in that. It's shelter, it's food. Um, we, um, I, I have, in my forest that we planted, we never remove the leaves. We just, they stay all the time. And different wildflowers came up that weren't, certainly weren't there when they were in the lawn. And birds work in it all the time. They're sifting through the leaves and finding insects. Um, you want to have, in a, in a habitat, you want to have a small water feature. All I have is a bird bath and it works fine. Um, you have, this is um, a picture of my, my whole yard. Um, so you can see that this is that forest you saw before. Um, and then around on these two sides of this patio are, um, this is full sun, so these are native plant gardens. I call them, I call them my prairies. They're, um, they're, they're on long strips of garden, maybe 20 feet by, by four feet deep and they um, have some shrubs in the back and some and native perennials and grasses in front. So this picture was taken in September. Um, is there any, are there any questions? Let me stop for a minute um, about habitats, about creating habitat before I go on. So we have had a few questions come in. Um, okay. One was, um, what flowers can I grow in a uh, dry shade? Okay, um, asters. You can grow asters in dry shade and you can grow, um, that's in fall, and you can grow our native geranium, geranium maculatum in, in dry shade. Both of them will do great. That's, in, that's a spring bloomer that's coming into bloom right now. That's particularly dry shade. You can grow, um, if you look at this picture right here, um, my site is very, very dry. The soil, it's a, it, was, it would have been a river basin and the soil is, was really like beach sand when I started gardening. It's very dry, it drains very well. Um, these are plants, this is pol polymonium, Jacob's Ladder. And this is Tiarella, which is a pretty common plant that you're, you're probably familiar with. Um, they like a little bit of a moisture site, but they will grow in dry shade. They're coming back for me. Another one that will grow in dry shade is false Solomon seal. Not true Solomon seal, it really needs a moisture site. Um, so lots of asters. There are, um, there are goldenrods for shade. Crooked stem goldenrod will do well in dry shade. Um, there are ferns that will do well. Um, the um, Christmas fern and marginal wood fern are, will both do well in dry shade, as will our native pachysandra. And I'm going to show you a picture of that later. Um, that combines really nicely with, um, uh, with, um, with um, ferns. I don't want to, you know, I'm probably spending too much time on any one question. Are there, are there other questions now? There are. Um, so we have two other questions. And before we get into the rest of the questions, um, is there anything, is there something in your background making a little bit of noise? Folks are noting a background noise. I think my chair you. squeaks. Oh, I'll try to sit still. I think my chair squeaks. Do you I hear it now? It almost sounds like a computer is like overheating. So if that's it, there's nothing we can do. But I just wanted to note. My that computer right. does make a noise sometimes, but it's not doing it right now. Okay, no worries. We will just, um, everyone else is muted, so um, uh, just wanted to check. Yeah. So, okay, next I've been question. Not to speak so much. <laughs> <laughs> next question is why do you need to clean out the um, trail conference garden every spring, and does this allow the overwintering insects and bees to be all be out? Yeah, that's a, those are very good questions. You need to um, clear it out because what would clear it out in nature is fire. Um, there, there would be occasional fires and all of this stuff that builds up year after year and it's a lot of plant material, dry plant material, would eventually disappear because of fire and obviously we can't do that. 
So um, you do need to remove the material. We compost it. We don't burn it or, you know, or throw it in the garbage. We, we put it in a, in a compost pile so that we're not hurting the insects. And what you do is you wait until the weather warms up a little bit. You wait until, I'm going to sh actually show you this a little later on, but you wait until you see quite a bit of new green growth and then you remove last year's material. You don't do it until, until then. So yes, um, we do everything possible to make sure we don't hurt those insects. And you also don't rake the ground very clean. You want to, um, you, you want to leave some detritus on the ground. Anything else for now? Fantastic. There was one more question, but it looks like it was already answered by Linda in the chat about orange butterfly weed and when it comes back. Um, and Linda noted that it comes up um, late as the soil temperature warms. So. Yeah, for, for me, all the, all the uh, milkweeds emerge late. They're one of the last perennials to emerge. And right now, um, again, I'm in, North, I'm in Bergen, Bergen County. They are just, you can just see them. They're just starting to come up. They'll probably pop pretty fast now because it's going to be hot. Okay, um, selecting plants. So we've talked about um, starting um, what you want to do, your overall goal in creating a garden. Now selecting plants, doing your research. The main question I get is what should I plant? And there are lots and lots of good resources for what you should plant. Um, the very best are native plant societies. If you're in New York, the Native Plant Center at Westchester Community College in New Jersey, the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. And as I said, our chapter meets at Trail Conference headquarters on the se second Wednesday of each month, and we are having online meetings right now. If you're primarily interested in a garden for pollinators, both the Xerces Society and the North American Butterfly Association have, um, they have regional plant lists. So you can get a good variety of native plants, um, a list of a good variety of native plants appropriate for your region on their websites. Field, good field guides to butterflies also list um, host plants. Um, as a, for a wider way of looking at the topic, field guides, and I particularly recommend the Peterson Guide to Eastern Forests, which I have used for many years, will tell you the way plants grow together in communities. Because if you want to, plants do naturally grow together in communities. If you see a red, um, a red maple, you know you're in a wetland area and there are particular plants that tend to grow under that red maple, both shrubs and, and ground level plants. So the Peterson Guide will tell you all about that. So you look at your trees and then you can start to realize what you should be planting under your trees. There are great reference books, um, like, a, like Doug Tallamy's two books. This is all on your resource list that you're going to get, so you don't need to be writing this down. So those are, those are basic resources. And then once you do that, you start to think about design. What do you want it to look like? Do you want a formal look? Do you want a very natural look? Some people would call it a messy look. Um, so what do you want the garden to look like? You can do an English cottage garden. You can do a Japanese style garden. All of these are possible with native plants. And there's a great book about that. There's a woman named Carolyn Summer who wrote um, a book about how to design different types of gardens with native plants. Again, it's on the resource list. Then um, you want to, when you're, as you're starting to put your list together, you want to choose plants that vary in height and that bloom throughout the season. And you want to think about those layers if you have enough room to include shrubs as well as some other things. Um, so you're going to develop a preliminary list of plants and then you're going to prepare your site. Um, I have found that a very good way to do this is to, so to go back to the most basic things, is your site wet or dry? Is it sunny or shady? Really basic. Don't plant wetland plants in a dry site because if you do, you will have to water them forever and you don't want to have to do that. You want to put the right plant in the right place. Um, decide how to prepare the area to be planted. Most native plants will need no soil amendment ever. In other words, you're going to plant them in your soil the way, the way your soil is, but you may have to kill the lawn. You may have to get rid of some other plants that are there. There are many ways to kill a lawn. The, um, the, um, 
if you go online and you Google killing lawn, you will see solarization, you will see um, lasagna method, you'll see all kinds of stuff. I just mulch. I either dig it up if it's a small enough area and you can just dig a couple of inches down because most lawns have very shallow roots. You can dig it up and then you can compost the grass or um, as you see here, this was just a very small garden that I did for a client and this had been lawn and some other plants and we removed the plants we didn't want. We mulched, this is probably four inches of cedar or hemlock, shredded cedar or hemlock bark. And then we're gonna plant right in this, right through it, down to the ground below. Um, one um, really very easy thing to do, many people have been for years trying to grow grass in areas that are too shady for grass. So the lawn looks terrible. And this was something that I worked on at a friend's house. Um, don't look at the plants that are there. They're not things I would have planted. But um, she had, um, it's, a very, it's a very large front lawn. It was quite shady. This is just one of the big trees. And it was all just really crappy looking grass because it was too shady for grass and kind of moist. So I suggested that she mulch large areas around the big trees. We joined some trees in islands, but we mulch this big area and then you just plant in it. Um, this, you can see the size of the area that was an island um, around this tree before we did this. We extended it like this. If it were me planting, I would plant ferns and all kinds of, of um, understory shade plants of different levels and things, but this is what she did. Um, and that's fine, but you can, um, you, um, but that's just an idea for how to get started in a, in a fairly small area. And that grass will be killed pretty effectively with, um, with a nice thick layer of mulch. You could also use your leaves in the fall. If you mulch an area in the fall when the grass is not growing vigorously, mulch it either with, um, with some shredded bark mulch or with a thicker layer of leaves, like maybe 10 or 12 inches of leaves. In the spring, the grass will be dead and you can just plant through it. The mulch will have um, condensed a bit too, you just plant right through it. Um, when you're planning, when you're making your, your plans, you're gonna measure, of course, for perennials, grasses, and ferns. If you eventually want a fairly crowded garden, you plan on approximately one plant per square foot. If you're planting shrubs, shrubs vary in size very greatly, but say you're planting an aronia, um, figure about three by three or nine square feet. If you want a denser border, you're gonna put them closer. If you want it more spread out, you're gonna do it um, more openly, obviously. Make a sketch on graph paper of your area um, assign a number, you know, X number of boxes per square foot and fill in your plants. You can use different colors for different plants. And then when you're done, just, you know, use colored pencil. When you're done, just count the number of different plants you put in and you know how many plants you need. Um, you can also just figure if you've got 20 square feet, 20 plants. Next step, finding the plants. And that's the hard part. Um, the, um, Find, finding um, pure species native plants is, it's getting easier, but it's not easy. Um, these are three sources. Again, you're gonna get these on your resource list. Um, the first two, I, first one I have used myself for many years. The second one, I know many, many people who use it. The third one is in South Jersey, and this list was compiled um, by another leader in the Native Plant Society, so I'm sure it's reliable. Um, but you're going to get another list at the end. Um, always, when you're coming up with your plant list, have two or three selections for each plant you want because you may not find the exact species you want. Um, plants sell out in the winter. Um, that's why another reason it's a good idea to prepare your site in fall, order your plants over the winter, and you know you'll have them in spring. If you wait to order till now, most places are sold out of a lot of plants. Okay, just to give you an idea of growth, I am talking about starting with small plants, not with seeds. Um, there are, you can certainly start plants with seeds, but for a beginner doing a whole garden, it's greatly preferable to start with small plants. And just to give you an idea of growth, 
This was a demonstration garden that I planted in Glenrock, where, where I live, um, in front of Borough Hall, I think this was in 2017. And then eventually it was a demonstration because people wanted to know what it was going to be look, what it was going to look like if we planted this long garden, long marked off garden, all as native plants, which we eventually did the following year. But I planted these with little divisions from my garden on April 15th. This is what it looked like in early June. And this is what it looked like in early October. So they grow fast and they fill in nicely. If you had, um, now these were divisions of mature plants. I just, you know, popped plants out of the ground, divided them and popped them back in the ground here. Um, they were not seedlings. If you had started with seedlings, probably at the end of the season, it would look like this rather than like this, but you'd get good growth. If you started with seeds, most native plants, I mean, certainly you can grow native plants from seeds. It's a little bit of a specialized thing. Most native plants um, want to develop very large root systems. And to do that takes time. So very often the first year's growth will be about that big. And then the second year's growth will be, you know, a decent sized plant and it may bloom. The third year you'll have a beautiful full plant that will bloom. In the meantime, if you've just sowed seeds, the weeds are gonna overtake the plants and you're gonna have a lot of trouble um, keeping the weeds under control. The, um, so it's, it's, really, it's better to start from plants. To start from seeds, um, you would, um, for example, um, they all need cold stratification, which means they need a cold period before they will germinate. So you can sow them in fall or you can keep them in a nice cold, damp place um, all through the winter. Um, you can plant them. What, one really good way to do it is to plant them in flats and then just leave the flats outdoors for the winter. And then the plants will start to germinate in the spring and then you can plant them in the ground right away. But it's not a great idea to start a garden, a whole garden, just by throwing seeds in the ground. Um, you will not be really happy with the, with the results you get. Um, Plants look different as, as tiny seedlings than they do when they're older, so you may not recognize everything. Um, another thing um, that I would warn you against is don't buy things that are labeled wildflower mixes. Wildflower doesn't really mean anything in either horticulture or botany, so most of the plants in wildflower mixes are non-native annuals. They're not peren native perennials, which is really what you want. And you're going to find that it may look really pretty the first year. You may have a nice mix of plants the first year. The second year, you're just going to have a mess of weeds. Um, that's, so it's, it's really not the way to go. The way to go is to buy small plants, um, for, certainly for the novice gardener. And I think for most people as well, it's, it's, um, it's easier and probably cheaper in the long run to, um, to start particularly a small garden from plants rather than from seeds. Okay, care of a native plant garden once you have planted it. Um, most plants, if you plant the correct plant in the correct place, most plants will need some supplemental water during dry periods for their first growing season only. That's perennials and grasses. Trees can, um, will, may need some supplemental water during dry periods for later seasons. A rule of thumb is one year of watering for one inch of trunk. So if you plant a tree that's got a two inch diameter trunk, you may want to, um, you should water that during dry periods for two full growing seasons. But for most of these plants, you're gonna see, if you put them in as plants, like say now, it's hot, so you wanna water a lot. But a couple of weeks from now, you're gonna see that they suddenly take off. They don't wilt in the heat anymore. They're gonna just really take off and you know they're established and you can um, kind of step back from the watering. So, um, but if it doesn't rain for a week in that first year, I would certainly water. The main thing about growing um, a habitat is do not use pesticides or herbicides and beware of purchasing plants that are treated with systemic pesticides. They are, um, you can buy yourself a beautiful milkweed and if it's treated with systemic pesticides, the, um, you've probably heard about neonicotinoids, the, um, the caterpillars that eat it will die. 
so don't do that. Um, in general, last year, the American Gardening Association put out an advisory that people should avoid buying plants from big box stores. In other words, the Lowe's and the Home Depot's and the, uh, the Walmarts, because those plants are all treated. If you buy from a small specialty nursery, the plants will not be treated with pesticides. You can always ask, but they, I'm sure that they will tell you these plants are not treated with pesticides. I've never encountered it in the nurseries that I deal with. Um, these plants should never need fertilizer or any kind of soil amendment, either when you plant or later on. And as we've already discussed, do not clean up the garden until spring. So I think, hang on, let me see what's next. Oh, okay, so this is garden clean. I'll stop at the end of the, of, um, I think it's the next slide, and, and to get some more questions about, about the nitty gritty. Um, this is garden cleanup in spring. And again, this is a section of my garden that's probably, I don't know, this is probably eight to 10 feet. So in the spring, you can see that there's quite a bit of new growth that's visible here. These are shrubs over here. There's quite a bit of new growth coming up. So you get in there and you grab the stalks about six to eight inches up and you, you just, um, you go and they, um, and they break. You just break them off. You don't pull because some plants are a little bit shallow root with this stage and can come away. So you just, you just break them off. And what I do is I put them onto a tarp and because I don't have room in my property to compost all of this, we take it to our town composting site. Not this year, but most years we take it to our town composting site. So then you remove the sticks and things. And then um, I also then take a, a rake and I very gently will rake off some of the detritus, not all of it. You don't want to see really see bare ground, but you want to get most of it out because if there are small plants growing or seedlings, you want them to, to not be shaded out. So, um, so that's what you do. And I would say this section, I mean, maybe it takes 10 or 15 minutes to clear it. So just um, if, you, if you think about that, this is about five feet deep and about maybe 10 maybe 10 feet long. So you just, um, you can really do it very quickly. Um, it's, um, so that's really the major part of, um, of care for a native plant garden. Okay, I'm gonna take some questions here because the remainder is just a couple of slides that show, I'm gonna show you uh, just a few plants that are particularly easy. Are there any questions right now? Uh, we did get a few questions to come in. Um, so first one was, are there any native plants that grow under very specific conditions so that if it thrives in a certain area, it will confirm growing conditions such as pH, soil versus sand, drainage, wet versus dry, etc.? I'm not sure, that kind of turns you've turned it around 180 degrees from the way I generally think about it. Um, you can test your soil for pH and for soil for loam versus sand, and that's pretty easy to do. Um, so if you want to know that, it might be better to test your soil. Um, it's usually pretty clear whether you've got a dry site or a wet site. There are certain plants that will absolutely not grow on wet sites or vice versa, but most plants are pretty good over a wide range of conditions. Um, in general, our soil tends to be slightly on the acid side, and that is the best for growing the widest range of plants. It's unlikely in this area that you'd have alkaline soil. It might be circumneutral around seven. Um, mine tends to be close to neutral because it's because it's sandy, but it is still slightly alkaline. Um, if you put in blueberries, which require quite an acid soil, um, and they don't do well, you'll know your soil isn't acid enough. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure I'm answering that correctly. But. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's the best I can do. So I do tend to, particularly with um, people putting in their first gardens, I do tend to rely on a list of plants that I know are very easy to grow. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna put a shade plant in a sunny site or vice versa, but there are plants that really do well under a wide range of conditions. Um, did, I, did I do it? I'm not sure I answered that. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So um, the next question we got was, what kind of mulch do you recommend? Okay, once the garden is established, I never mulch again. 
um, the mulch, um, you would mulch to kill grass the first time around or just because the plants are very small when you start and it'll keep down weeds. Um, but what I recommend is shredded cedar or hemlock bark, not dyed. So natural shredded cedar or hemlock bark, not treated in any way. But um, once, um, as you can see from these gardens you're looking at, there's no mulch there. There's, uh, these gardens have been here for a while and they're, they're doing their thing and there's, there's no more mulch. Um, mulch is, um, it, at the beginning, you know, when the soil is exposed, it will help keep the roots cool. It will help keep the weeds down, but you don't need it if you're planting closely anymore. Go ahead, more questions. Um, yes, yeah. so there was a question when you were talking about uh, mail ordering and um, someone asked when is there a best time to actually order? Um, it's getting a little late actually. The best time to order, many of these places do sell out of plants, so the best time to order is over the winter. Um, but you can call them, they're, they're smaller operations and you can call them. Some of them will stop shipping for the hot months. Um, they, um, so you, you know, call them and find out what's going on or email them. You'll have all the information when you get your resource list. It's a, um, I, I don't like to plant anymore once the weather heats up. Um, plants tend to grow roots when the soil is cool and they do top growth when the soil is, is warm. So if you want good root growth, which is what you want, it's best to plant as soon as you can, which as early as you can, which in our area is generally, you're not really going to get plants until maybe the second or third week in April. And that's a great time to plant. Generally by Memorial Day, I like to stop planting. If you do plant after that, give them lots and lots of water. You can do it. But give them lots and lots of water. Reputable growers are not going to ship you plants um, when it's too hot or you know when they know it just some of them actually stop shipping during the summer. Um, so um, so you can plant there's another window for planting as things cool off in the fall. So go ahead. The next question is does deer off either in liquid or pellet form harm the insects? I have no idea. I've never used any of those things. Does, I don't know if it works for the deer. Um, there are some techniques for deer and none of them involve spraying anything on plants. So I, I, don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would imagine they wouldn't like it because I don't know what it is, but most, but most life is based on the same chemistry. So who knows? Um, if it's just a bad smell, it might be fine. Um, there are techniques for deer. I was waiting for the deer question. We always get the deer question and it's, and it's a nightmare around here. Um, we had a very warm winter, which means that damage from deer and woodchucks and rabbits is awful this year. It's really bad. They're eating things they never ate before. Um, I have found a couple of techniques for, for this. First of all, there is a list of native plants that deer do not prefer. It doesn't mean they don't eat them. It means they, they prefer other things. And you can get that from the Native Plant Society's website. Um, it tends to be different by location. It tends to be cultural. I mean, I've, I hear people from, from the middle of, of New Jersey say, from central New Jersey say, oh, you know, in my area, deer never eat whatever. And I know in my area, they love it. So it, it does tend to be very, very, very site specific. But one thing you can do, there are a few plants that they really don't like. One of them is this right here, little blue stem. Many of the native grasses have some silica, some sharp pieces in them and they, and they, they won't eat them because it's painful. So this particular grass, some but not all native grasses, they really do leave alone. Most things in the mint family and our native plants in the mint family are the monardas. We call it bergamot very often. There's several, several species there. Um, Agastache, anything in that genus, and the mountain mints, which are pycnanthemum genus. Um, they do tend to leave anything in those um, areas alone. And for the most part, they don't eat milkweed. Although that's not true of all species. I have, I'm having a lot of trouble with world milkweed, which gets eaten. Um, so, for, but for the most part, um, the, the, the milkweeds that people tend to grow, which are orange butterfly weed and red milkweed and common milkweed, do tend to be left alone. 
So that's, you know, that gives you a good place to start. They love asters. They just love asters. But you, so if you have the plants very tight and you have the plants they don't like very close to the plants they do like, um, you can sometimes protect the plants they do like. It works better toward, um, as you get into more crowded gardens than it does right now when the garden is still looking, when there's still space between the plants. Um, so that works very well. And it also works to, um, to not, I know it might look better for design sometimes, but to not put all the plants of one species in one place, to scatter things around, particularly the plants they like the best, scatter them all around your garden. They won't find them all. They really won't. Um, they're not, you know, they're eating what's, what's readily, <laughs> what, what they come across first. Um, Sorry, my landline rang. Um, okay, I think. Um, so you have quite a few more questions coming in. It sounded like you just have like a couple more slides. Do you want to run I through? Do. Those yeah, quickly, I was just. And gonna, then we'll dedicate to okay. uh, Q and I was just gonna, and it's really up to you how long you want to go because we really are almost at an hour now. Um, the, um, the I just wanted to show you um, some quite easy to grow plants and what you can achieve in a very small area. These, are, um, these pictures are both the same area of, um, of a border, and this one is taken in June, and this one is taken in early September. It's the same area. So as you see here, this is a little blue stem. As it looks in June, it's just coming up. It just kind of looks grassy. This is what it looks like in September when it's bloomed and gone to seed. In the meantime, the Monarda that was right here this Monarda has finished blooming, and this Rebecca has thrust itself forward. Um, so you can see here, you've got um, the little blue stem, you've got orange butterfly weed, again, it's June, you've got orange butterfly weed, you've got Monarda, and you've got sundrops, Fruticosa anathera, in the same spot in the, in the, um, the fall, early fall, you have got little blue stem, You've got Rudbeckia. In the back here, you can see New England asters that are just starting to bloom. There's shrubs in back here, too. So this is, these are all quite easy to grow. These are for dry sites for the most part. Some of them are a little more adaptable, although actually um, Menarda is called a wetland plant, but it does great anywhere. You can grow it anywhere as long as you've got sun. Um, you can, um, so it just shows you they're, they're planted pretty tightly, although if you looked at this spot now, it looks very sparse. It doesn't look like it's going to be anything right now, but this is what you can do in a really a very small spot with quite, with quite a few plants. Um, so, to just look at a few common plants that are easy to grow and highly recommended. The Monarda in the previous slide was um, the pink or lavender species, which is Monarda my brain is going sour. This is the red one. It's Monarda didyma. Um, there are two. There are generally two or three species. So this is um, the red one, Monarda didyma. The um, the the, um, the white one is Monarda punctata. And for some reason, the Latin name of the lavender one is not coming to me at the moment, but it will. Um, this is New England aster. Whether you have um, sun or shade. Um, wet or dry, you need to grow asters. Um, um, Doug Tallamy in his books talks about plants that attract the greatest number, that feed the greatest number of caterpillars. In the tree world, it's oaks. In the, um, peren in the world of perennial plants, non-woody plants, it's asters. You want to have asters in your garden. They're wonderful pollinator plants and they're really important in the environment. If you look at almost any natural environment, in the, um, the mid-Atlantic or in uh, New England that's growing fairly naturally because many of our environments are not natural, um, you will see asters and goldenrod and grasses. Asters, goldenrod and grasses on the seashore, in the shade, in a wetland, anything. There's always species and they go together. Um, New England aster is quite adaptable, but there are many others for sun. Orange butterfly weed, the other common ones, other common um, milkweeds that people grow, are in particular red, um, red butterfly weed, or which is um, Asclepias incarnata. It has pink flowers and it's a little bit of a taller plant. Orange butterfly weed is for dry sites only. 
it will not do well. It has a big fat tuberous root and it will rot in a wet site. Um, red butterfly weed, you can grow anywhere as long as you have sun, it's very adaptable. Onothera fruticosa is a sun drop. It's, um, it's related to, um, oh, what are they called? <laughs> the common names sometimes don't come to me, but um, the onotheras are um, called, they're called evening primroses. They're, there's a species that's a biennial that, that you know, blooms at night. This one is a perennial. And I saw this growing in the wild, coming out of the rocks on the seacoast in Northern Maine. That's how tough this plant is. Um, and it spreads really nicely. It's only about 18 inches tall and it'll bloom through most of the month of June. It's really easy to grow and it's great. For, um, I, I would imagine it would do well in wetter sites too, but it does really great in dry, shit, in dry sun. Um, little blue stem, it really is blue. It's quite lovely. I talked about Agastache with my buckeye, which I'm very proud of before. Um, this is Agastache funiculum or Anis hyssop, and it is another plant in the mint family that critters tend not to eat. Coneflower, um, Echinacea, is technically not native to this area, but we, it's native a little further west, but we grow it anyway. Um, it's, um, this one does not do well for me. You need a wetter site and the critters also love it, so I can't keep it going. But if you have a, uh, if you have some, you know, some wet shit from wet sun, I would definitely try it. Rudbeckias, um, there are uh, a number of them. There are taller ones. There are shorter ones. This is my particular favorite. It's Rudbeckia triloba. I showed it to you before, and if you look carefully, you can see there's a little caterpillar on here. I don't even know what that is, but when I after I took the picture, I realized it was caterpillar there, probably eating the seeds. Who knows? Um, or maybe, you know, maybe just eating the flower parts. Um, the um, probably showing my ignorance about caterpillars. Too. But um, so these are all e quite easy to grow. For shade, those were the sun for shade. This is um, a, a, sh a border that probably gets two to three hours of morning sun. And in May, not quite right now because things are late this year, but very soon. Um, the red is our red columbine, our native columbine, and this is our only native columbine. If you see white columbine, purple columbine, blue columbine, they're from California or from the Rocky Mountains or from um, Europe. They are not our native columbine. This guy, these flowers are about to open, and as soon as they open, I will have hummingbirds because they're timed, they seem to be timed to the hummingbird migration. So I know that I will see hummingbirds in a few days. As soon as these open, they sit from underneath. It's wonderful. And this is growing with um, our native geranium, which I believe I mentioned before for dry shade. I think it can do, I think it's, um, people generally say it's fine for a moderate soil or even for a little wetness. The columbine definitely needs a dry site. Um, you, um, there, if you look carefully at this garden, talking about succession again, there's lots of asters in here. These are shade asters, and these are going to bloom in August and September. The columbine and the, and the geranium will kind of disappear, and the, um, the columbine is not an ephemeral or reusable stay, but the, um, but, there, but the asters will all be in bloom in fall. Um, so here are some fairly easy to grow shade plants. Most of our, of our shade plants are spring bloomers. Many of them are spring ephemerals, meaning that they complete their whole life cycle before the trees leaf out. Um, they, um, this is the, the geranium again, very easy to grow and very lovely. It's just opening now. Um, two different ferns combined with native pachysandra down here. This is our native pachysandra. Um, it kind of drapes gracefully. It doesn't stand up straight the way the Japanese one does, the one that everybody grows. This is marginal wood fern, and over here is Christmas fern. So this is a spot that probably gets an hour of sun, and, um, and these guys have filled in very nicely. The, um, the pachysandra spreads over time. I think I showed you this before, Jacob's Ladder, Colomonium, and Tiarella. These are just starting to bloom right now. And as you can see, again, there's lots of asters here. So those are going to bloom later. Um, false Solomon seal and geraniums again. Um, false, there's, um, they're naturally not closely related, but false Solomon seal blooms at the end here and it'll make really fabulous red berries um, in, in, the, um, in the fall. True Solomon seal blooms 
underneath here. And they're not, they're not closely related plants, it's just the common names. Um, they, um, they do, the deer too tend to like them quite a lot. Um, this, the fall Solomonsula is easy to grow in the shade. They're both easy to grow in the sun. In, excuse me, they're both shade plants. This one is easier to grow in, um, in a dry site. The, the, both of them will do very well in a moist site. These are um, shade asters and shade goldenrod. This is crooked stem goldenrod, which is really great for shade. Um, the aster, I've had this aster for so long that I don't remember the species. If Linda's still there, I'm sure she can tell us the species, but I've just had it forever. And I, and I just don't even know what it is. Um, but, it, but these uh, spread by rhizomes and are very easy to move around and to put in different parts of your garden. And they will bloom generally from, um, from late August through October. And they'll attract those late pollinators and they'll sort of keep the garden alive. Um, a plant that I'm very fond of and that many people consider to be a weed is violets. They are, um, they, they're blooming right now. There are state flower. There are a dozen or more species. I believe this is the common violet, but this is just my lawn, um, the, uh, which is Viola sororia. The, um, they are the only host plant for a large family of butterflies, the fritillaries. Um, so um, I'm very often asked, how can I remove violets from my lawn? And the way I always want to reply is, why would you want to? So encourage them. Uh, uh, that's really all. So I think that's our last slide. Yes, the, um, that you, if you put in your full name, again, Kendra, I guess, will explain this, so I'm not being clear about it, but if you type in your full name, um, she will send you um, a pretty detailed resource list. And I think that's it. So questions? Great. Um, yeah, so everybody, we'll send a follow-up with all of the um, resources and also a link to our page where we'll have the recording of this so you can re-watch it um, if you want. Um, so to get into the uh, questions, um, one that came up multiple times was, when is a good time to divide established plants? Okay. Um, the best time to divide plants is always when they, when they emerge in the spring. You're giving them the greatest time possible to recover. So as soon as you see a plant emerge, if you want to divide it, just dig it up and divide it. I have plants that I'm waiting to come up so I can divide them. I'm just checking on them because um, that's, that's the best time. The best time to do it, I mean, is for, for a wider area, uh, the best time is while it stays cool now. For these native plants that, that develop very large root systems, I would never um, suggest dividing them in fall. It's just too difficult. Um, what happens is that the root systems get to be quite big um, throughout the growing season, they grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the roots die back and contribute to the organic matter in the soil over the winter, which is why our soils are good, which is why my soil, which used to be beach sand, is now black loam, because I've had these plants in place for 20, 25 years. The, um, so I would, not do, I would not attempt dividing these plants in, um, in the fall, because it would be too difficult. But in the spring, it tends to be easy. Okay. So um, another question was, do you pick three or four plants and buy several of each? I seem to be buying all different plants and I don't know if I should stick to a few instead of a lot of different kinds of flowers. You know, that's kind of up to you. What you might want to do is to look at the, um, the NABA or Xerces Society lists and see if you're hitting, and some of it depends on room. I mean, if you don't have much room and you want a wide variety of plants, um, just put in, put in lots of species. I mean, why not? Um, if, they're, if they're the right plants for your place. But make sure you're hitting all, what they do is they tell you, you you really should be hitting certain plant families to get the widest variety of host plants. So that's one way to do it. And then maybe you can pick a few species within those families. Um, so that's that may be a good way to do it if you're um, really kind of, um, you know, I don't know, overexcited when you look when you look at a plant catalog, which is very easy to be. Okay, go ahead. So next question, any advice for a large open area? We're looking to eliminate lawn space and replace with a low maintenance native landscape, about one acre. Whoa, okay. 
um, I would um, read Larry Wiener's books <laughs> or his book. Um, Larry Wiener is um, a landscape architect who has pioneered large meadow plantings and he has techniques. Wiener is W-E-A-N-E-R. So that's the first thing I would do um, and, and see what he suggests. Um, the next thing I would look at is what the trees are and how much shade there is, what the trees are will tell you what should be planted under them. Uh, again, if you go back to the Peterson Guide to Eastern Forests or to any good field guide to forests, if you know what the trees are, you'll know what should go under them. And then you can start from there. Um, plant a shrub layer, plant a ground, plant ground cover. Um, that's, um, I, I think I answered your question, um, but it really, and a lot of it depends on how much shade you have. Great. Next one. Is there a clover that is native to New Jersey? I see clovers in my beds and lawns and I've been leaving them. Well, lawn clovers are, are not. Um, there are clover plants that are native. If Linda's still here, she could probably answer this better than I can. I would have to look that up. But Linda may know that off the top of her. I'm sure she knows it off the top of her head. Um, so we're going to wait and see if she I missed the question. Can you repeat the question? Uh, are there, is there a clover that's native to this area? The, in other words, a lawn type clover. I know, because I know most of our common lawn clovers are not native. There's no short clover, they're bush clovers, so they're taller and they're meadow plants. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought. So no, <laughs> so the answer is no. Okay. Um, the and they're not doing any harm. They're not going to march into the woods and take over the understory, and they're um, they're they're serving pollinators and they're um, adding nitrogen to your soil. So, I wouldn't it wouldn't be the first thing I would address if I were going to get rid of non-native plants. Okay. So next question is: Is there a good resource for succession gardening with natives so there are blooms throughout the season? Ah. Um, well, the way to do that is that any good catalog is going to tell you when it blooms. So um, you, um, um, that's, you know, that's what you look at. The catalog is going to tell you that it blooms from, from July to August or from, you know, from May to June. And then you can select your plants. Um, that's one of the criteria you're going to use. It's really, you're really thinking about four dimensions when you, um, when you select your plants, the fourth being time. Um, the, um, you know, when they're going to bloom, when they're going to emerge, um, when they're, um, whether they're going to turn color in the fall, you might want to look at that because some native plants actually, um, native perennials actually turn beautiful colors in the fall. So that can give you, oh, right here, look at this. This is sun drops in the fall. The, um, it gets this deep red color. Penstemon does that too. I don't think I showed Penstemon, which is a great, um, a really, really good perennial um, that nothing seems to eat. Penstemon digitalis. It has, I don't think I showed it in this program. Um, and it turns red in fall. Pretty, very pretty. It's about to bloom now. Sorry. So yeah, so that really the catalogs will tell you that. Uh, next question was, um, what should you plant with Joe Pye? Um, well, again, it depends on your soil and the site. Joe pie weed is um, a large group of plants. It's actually many plants in a genus. And there are plants for, um, for sun and for partial shade. There are some that are very tall. There are some that are for wetlands. So you want to look at um, the particular species that you're thinking about or um, the, the right one for your site and then find other other plants that are right for that site But generally it's going to grow in a meadow with um, with asters and butterfly weed and and um, uh, And uh, and grasses and things like that. So it's going to be part of part of a meadow type planting or a prairie type planting Okay, um, what do you and I, you may have gone over this but just a quick recap What do you recommend for a wet shady site? A wet shady site, yeah. Um, okay, there are um, off the top of my head. There are numerous plants for wet shade. Um, there are some of the shrubs are plethora, spice bush, and um, button bush are all shrubs for wet shade for, um, for wet shady sites. There is our native impatiens 
which um, it's called spotted jewelweed, or it's called jewelweed or spotted touch me not. It has either yellow or orange flowers. It's an annual and that grows in wet shade. There are many ferns that grow in wet shade. Um, Jack in the pulpit, tri many trilliums will grow in wet shade. Um, you could try them, they'll be expensive, but you could try them and if they work, wow. Um, the um, uh, May apple, many, many of our, um, of our spring ephemeral plants, spring ephemeral plants will do well in wet shade. Again, um, as you're selecting plants, you need to look at a field guide, um, you need to look at a specific catalog, but there are, but there are many. Great. Um... And then you mentioned a few, but I guess uh, if you just want to give like a top favorite, um, what are some of the hardier plants and flowers for a new and experienced person? Okay, I'm assuming you're talking about sun. I'm just going to assume that. Um, for a sunny, hmm? That was not specified, so. Yeah, um, uh, again, that's always the first question, sun or shade, wet or dry. So plants that are very adaptable and that just tend to do really, really well as long as you have sun. Red milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. Little blue stem, which is um, beautiful native grass. I showed it a couple of times. There are other native grasses that would do very well too. Just, you know, avoid, if you don't have a large space, avoid the really tall ones. Some of them can be eight feet. You don't want those, but um, panic grass is, is a beauty. Um, it tends to like a little bit of a wetter site. Um, for perennials, asters, always asters, and penstemon, um, and the, um, the bergamots, monarda. Um, there's the, the pink one, the name finally came to me. Monarda fistulosa um, is the pink or lavender. Um, bee, balm, bee balm, monarda, bergamot, it's all the same plant. Um, the, um, the Latin name is Monarda. So Monarda fistulosa is the pink one and Monarda didyma is the red one. The pink one tends to spread a little bit more and be a little bit easier to grow in some places. Um, I would, oh, did I, um, yeah, easy, very easy to grow plants. Coreopsis is extremely easy to grow. There are several species. Uh, very, very easy to grow. Joe Pieweed is, oh, most of these plants are really very easy to grow. Most of the, um, of the native prairie plants are really, it's kind of you put them in the ground and you stand back with a lot of them. They really, they just, they're very strong, um, very few things. That very, they won't have a lot of pest problems or disease problems, although they certainly will get eaten by deer and rabbits, um, but, they, but they tend to do very well. Great, and then I think this is the last question. Um, do you have any recommendations of gardening magazines that have, um, you know, articles more focused on native uh, gardening? Um, not magazines per se, but there are some great um, groups you can join that put out periodicals. Um, the, um, oh, the group that used to be called the New England Wildflower Society, it's now called the Native Plant Trust. And that's actually the oldest conservation group in the country. Um, if you join, it's well worth joining that because um, their website is excellent. They have lots of free programs, uh, educational programs on Native Plant Trust. They're in Massachusetts. They put out a magazine. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Research Center, which is the Botanical Garden of Texas. They put out a magazine. The Westchester um, Native Plants Native Plant Center at Westchester Community College also um, puts out some, some periodical stuff and they have a good website. So um, that's where um, not, not so much, you know, you're not going to open a regular gardening magazine and find, um, and find these plants for the most part, but these more specialty organizations, you can get lots of good information. Um, there's a, a, a program in Maine that puts out a magazine, is it the Wild Seed Project? I think that's what it's called. And they put out a magazine maybe um, quarterly, and that's, um, that has good information in it too. Particularly the Native Plant Trust in Massachusetts is excellent, they put out very good information. Great, and then um, for folks interested in getting in touch with you, um, 
for I help, um, we can provide that in the follow-up email or... You um, can do that, and I believe that I, my work email is on the resource list. I don't think I took it off because it's a modified version of one that I use for clients, and I don't think I took the information off, so it's probably there. Great. We will um, make sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that is. those are all the questions that came in. Um, so thank yeah. you so much, Elaine. We really appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you, you all everybody. for sticking it out. This was, uh, I was talking fast, I know. So, uh, okay, thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Yes, Bye. stay well, everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>